we are the Splice Poetry Series. What do we do? Anybody know? Splice. We splice. We take one local poet and we combine them in a single reading with an out-of-town poet. That's what we do. So t tonight, Lisa Passold, New Orleans Zone, will be reading, as well as Tucson, Arizona's Sarah Kortmeyer. Super good. You might not know, though, why I'm wearing what looks to be a funeral. Well, it's your own, because these readers are going to kill it. <laughs> it's your funeral. They are going to knock you dead. Rodrigo Toscano, with the eulogy. <laughs> In conversations with poet and critic Jennifer K. Dick, Lisa remarked how she enjoys poetry that has linguistic blur. And in my conversation with Lisa two weeks ago, followed up by email, she was telling me that, like other people born in one place and raised in another by parents who spoke mother tongues other than English, she can only recognize a mother country in the landscape of linguistic blurring where place Identity is already blurred, no matter where she is. And so she's interested in how that's translated throughout place history, remarking that poet Craig Santos Paris was someone she felt recent kinship with. To that kinship, I would add poets Paisley Rechtal, Cynthia Cruz, Myung Mi Kim, Jose Antonio Villaran, and Hank Rousseau from South Africa, who will be reading for the splice next month. All these writers walk fine lines of poetic liminality, avoiding capture by nation-state machinations for literature to serve the core mission of festooning civic functions like reliability about aboutness, as in quote, <laughs> what's the poem about? And this aboutness is all too often a homologue for nation-state accumulation processes. We can call it hoarding. Lisa Passold's writing is the complete 100% opposite of the hoarding of meaning making. Rather, the writing is so much of the time sans mule, wallless, and it evinces an irrepressible unreliability of set ethics, set moralities, set politics. Vraiment, je le dis avec un grand plaisir. Passold's sense of what a day is, might be, what a person is, what a circumstance is, is up in the air. And this, in this writing, there's no rummaging through, quote, themes. But ever so skillfully, Passel nets in the floating debris of social phenomenon into some of the richest poems and flash fiction pieces currently on offer. The works are generous, each with unique and inviting architectures, giving us a sense that everything displayed is available to touch and feel and take for free. And take it, we will, make cousin. The Splice is indeed very proud to present New Orleans very not owned para poet Lisa Passel. Lisa is the author of five books of fictions and poetry. In 2012, her work any Bright Horse was shortlisted for the Governor General's Award. Her first poetry collection, Weave, was called a masterpiece by Geist Magazine. Her second, A Bad Year for Journalists, was nominated for an Alberta Book Award and awarded Canada, a Canada Council grant to transform it into a theater piece. Lisa's first novel, Rats of Las Vegas, was called as enticing as the lit up Las Vegas strip and as satisfying a winning hand of poker by the Winnipeg Free Press. Her most recent poetry collection, The Riparian, was published by Fontenac House Calgary in late 2017. Lisa's poetry has appeared in magazines such as the Atlantic Review, the Los Angeles Review, and New American Writing. Lisa's journalism features 
have appeared in diverse publications, including the Chicago Tribune, The Globe, and Mail, and Billboard. She is the host and co-writer of Discovery World's TV travel show, Paris Next Stop. Lisa has written for radio and theater, and she is the creator of Improbable Walks, storytelling walks focusing on legends and place memory. She has created these art walks to critical acclaim for festivals and gallery residencies in such cities as Toronto, Saskatoon, and Paris. Let's give it up for Lisa Cashin. Thanks, y'all. Can you hear me okay? This is good? All right. Well done, microphone genies on the height of the microphone. It's always a thing. <laughs> All right, I am so honored to be here. Thank you all so much, Rodrigo, Sean, Henry. I really appreciate being here. I love being at the Saturn Bar. Big shout out to Heather and to Philip for bringing it back, which is really cool. In the uh, News Poets Bars issue, I'm actually part, a tiny part of a reading next. Friday also at 7 p.m. at the American Townhouse, 1012 North Rampart Street. There will also be cold beer. There might be slightly more air conditioning. And there will be five poets, including local Todd Cirillo, who's here somewhere. I lost track of you, baby. There you are. And uh, that will be on set at 7 p.m. So if you want more information, ask me afterwards. Now, I realize that today, looking at what I'm choosing to read, some of it is dark, because we live in dark times. Um, yeah, and there's no getting around that, so I'm gonna try and just, you know, survive the darkness with you, and we come from, live in, have adopted a place that's seen its fair share of darkness, so you know. But I thought I would start with a buttermilk drop. <laughs> Buttermilk drop for Ariel Gordon. By lady parts, you mean not the cunt, but the inner great clockwork gains of mystery and science. Though I do love the word cunt. The come hither hard swoop feel of it on the tongue and the place absence of it. When we mean cunt, it's admittedly wide ranging. It's a word I did not use on the phone long distance 20 years ago, back when we still used landlines. You remember those? Maybe some of you are too young. The big, beige, clunky landlines. I'd been packed, no sense of celebrity, then flew out to work. So I was in France when the results came in. I clutched that clunky, beige receiver, speaking to the doctor's secretary through transatlantic static, earnest in my panic, I said, but am I gonna die? Even now, I am indeed amazed she did not reply, yeah, baby, you're gonna die, sit the fuck down already. <laughs> but instead, she lied. Maybe because her mama told her, sometimes you gotta do like a magician with those rabbits. That day, she said, no, you're not gonna die. So now I can report so many years and two surgeries later while eating a particularly delicious buttermilk drop, which is, as you know, something like a donut hole, but there's a lot of icing, and really you can't describe it. You have to be there and experience it fully. Isn't everything quasi-miraculous when you think about it? That doctor's secretary was right. The lady parts hadn't killed me yet, though I understand what she meant back then was yet. What she was saying silently was not yet, love, not yet. <laughs> On the beach, in the sun, with friends, Late afternoon, we melted into this flattened peach of a day. I paused before the squashed pulp 
on your lips, you roll over for sunscreen. The plump man down the beach from us has excellent curly hair. Yeah, I noticed. Though mostly what I saw is how he seems desired by and yet distracted from the friend beside him who is so shy near him. The friend's got that old-school handsome going on. You know the kind, the lean, muscled part of the body and motion. But there's something about his gestures that betrays him. Is he in love with perfect curling hair man, who is maybe trying to ignore that fact, but awkward? God damn, you say, those scars are fresh. I hope he's wearing sunscreen. I hadn't noticed the scars. My sunglasses are spotted with salt water and my eyesight falters in brightness at the best of times. Now I wonder if the pair are only friends. My voice stumbles, fuck that word. Why is only so paltry a thing? Why isn't friendship considered an immense love? Isn't it as good as? Isn't it deeper than, more honest, more meaningful, despite all the valentines and all the weddings and all the fornications. The man turns to his friend and curves his fingers. Come with me into the water. All these small, kind gestures some of us have learned so slowly, offered in this sunshine where we are all a mess, but also okay. <laughs> in process, so it may or may not turn out like this at the end of times, but yeah, so you may have heard of someone named Jean-Baptiste Lemoine, he's a Montrealer like me. You might know him as Bienville, which actually translates to good town, Bienville. So this poem, dedicated to the city we're in, for better or worse. It's called Good Town. I'm writing an essay about the founder of New Orleans. No, that's not true. I'm writing an essay about a Frenchman. No, he wasn't. That's not right either. I'm writing an essay about a slick con man, always with the pretty patter, always with scheme jealous of his older brother, charming and untrustworthy and convinced. He can pull off just one more big job. That's closer. <laughs> Interpretation is power. Let me go further back for a moment. There was a man with communication issues. He was a Frenchman, Jacques Cartier, and if he had been slightly more successful in communicating with the people he met en route, he might have not made the mistake of taking two of the chief's sons back to France with him without offering two men of his own in exchange. Imagine if that had worked. Imagine if they had spoken. Imagine if they had learned about the other continent's peoples, if they had talked, if they had traded in knowledge. That didn't happen. What if it had? Wasn't he somebody who could believe in so many startling things before breakfast? Why didn't he see more than he expected? Why did he see land as emptiness or inconvenience or maybe something that was getting in the way of where he was going? So I am not writing an essay about a Frenchman. I don't care about Jacques Cartier. But Bienville, he was a French Canadian. He was Canadian. He was born in Montreal. He was a different kind of animal. He was the son of a translator or that's one interpretation. Canadian devised from the word Kanata, which means settlement in Iroquois, or at least that's one interpretation. Interpretation being power, it can be a passive resistance. I can understand what you're saying, but I am going to pretend not to, and I'm just going to watch you make googly eyes and a mouth like a catfish, and I think my granddaughter's 
laughing at you in the back, but we're just gonna keep stoic faced. You just keep going. I'm writing an essay about a slick con man, always with the scheme. Let me introduce you, you know, so you recognize him when you meet him in the bar later, and he starts with the pretty patter, and he starts to sell you a piece of the Eiffel Tower, which is honest to God, right here. You know, I think it's available right now. It's down on St. Charles. You're not buying it, are you? <laughs> okay. I am writing an essay about a Quebecois drifter, a grifter. He was short. He was not handsome. He was kind of greasy. <laughs> he was a child sailor. He was an orphan. He was the 10th son of 13. His eyes were bright with ambition. His mouth was rich with lies. Let's call him Bean. Rain ordinary. Snow ordinary, facts, facts, numbers. We're all in the process of becoming numbers, traded and forgotten. When there's a gap in the rain, I'll search for a moon of Jupiter. I'll look for the rings of Saturn. I say, I will call this nightmare the fall of Rome, and no one will care. <laughs> Later, I look at my notes and see that I have written, I am clothed in darkness. But when I reread it, what I read is, I am clothed in dorkiness. <laughs> my clothes do smell of mulch from lying on the ground and looking at the stars. And I am somewhat cold, hard to believe, right now in July. But I was looking up at the planets. I was saying, tell me, do. Bean lives to be 87 years old, or maybe 88 years old, because he lies about his own birthday. He lies about his own death. Who's going to go back and correct him now? His bones are gone. They've been mislaid, intentionally thrown into the river, thrown into the street. And maybe that's as it should be. Revolution, we're just pawns in the powers. Our lives are traded, constrained, ivory and marble, malachite and lapis, lazuli, ebony and quartz. The book I was reading about him ends mid-year, paddling through the mudflat marshlands, everything reflecting gray, silver, brown, mud, green grasses. His eyes are all those colors. They're murky. He's dead. That is in the book. So this is my scraped clean mood while tackling, embracing, tearing off that wig on that statue at the Triangle of St. Peter and Decatur, which very consciously does not show him in anything but formal dress. He's not marked up as indeed he was, because there are so many lines in this story, nothing but swerves, all the snake tattoos he wore below the neck. I walk out along the street, and a neighbor in a purple colored t-shirt and black dress pants comes out of his house and beeps his car on Sunday morning. I say, good morning, how you doing, as one does. And he says, good morning, sweetheart, I'm off to fight the devil. <laughs> I laugh, but I say, good luck. He says, you too. I'm writing a dishonest book that depends on luck, that depends on cards and the devil with those long fingered hands. Piquet and some, and some games with dice that we're not gonna get into right now. The one who controls the word controls the record. So we have to find every word, hold the language in our hands, on our skins, in our mouths. Don't use words lightly. Mark them, re-mark them, use your skin. Then they can be read if you undress, which you did. Let's start again. Bean was from Montreal. He spoke five languages, give or take. Eventually, one of the languages he used a lot was Yama, Mobilian trade language, Mobilian jargon, basically an invented language for trade. It was like a rough hatchet, like a perfectly weighted machete for the purpose, like a Swiss army knife, a blade.
blade, a word for every occasion, a tool for every need. Say what you mean to say. Wield the knife blade of language. Communicate, do it, throw the blade. Some time ago, I was not present. I was non-present. I was non-present for an entire winter season, as if I had no words. It was a phase of time called a depression, as if there was a pit, an indentation. But I was definitely above and detached and untethered. I walked outside in the darkness. I stopped to study the suddenly visible stars. A woman with her phone came up to me and said, are you all right? And I pointed and said, the Pleiades. She shied away from me as if I must be, this is true, threatening or drunk. She could tell I was untethered. I see Bean as the bad fairy at a wedding or a birth. He has lace collar and cuffs, but his hands are scarred, his face pockmarked, his skin and fingers are stained with blood and ink. There's nothing pretty in what he murmurs, leaning down to whisper in the damp infant's ear, using words that are not French. You will survive, he says. It was a curse. Today the news from the Cannes Film Festival is that Dene filmmaker Kelvin Redvers was removed from the red carpet because he was wearing moccasins, red-stained path. Redvers was forcibly made to change shoes by the security guard. This red carpet, this photographer gauntlet, the steps in Cannes, I've worked there. Once I worked there and later I ate a sandwich on those steps the morning after the festival had closed that red carpet. Women must wear heels. Men must wear formal leather shoes. Moccasins are formal leather shoes. <laughs> However, perhaps moccasins were simply unfamiliar. Perhaps. Insert a footprint of indigeneity here. I keep trying to make this sock puppet of a ghost of being dance, and he does not mouth the words I want to give him. He's even speaking English, which he spoke very badly. It was not one of his chosen tongues. He will not be my sock puppet, no matter how carefully I arrange the history. Sweet meat, not sweet heart. Swamp land, swelling his imagined heart. What's there or not there? The bullet wound that scored a line through his last tattoo. The symbolism of things wasted. Pride must have kept him upright. The pride of the small. The pride of the stubborn. I'm studying the mist for auguries. A rat runs casually past the windows along the fencing. I give Bean a speech to make. I pull on strings so his arms move up and down. But I'm not equipped to tackle it. That's what Maggie Nelson writes in Bluets, and that's true, my inability to tackle this subject of bienville, my lack of equipment, let's say. My lack of dick, my lack of appropriate Indian, my lack of appropriate French, my lack of approved blood ties to this landscape. When I'm tackling that ghost statue at the triangle down on Decatur, that odd triangle in the French Quarter that isn't French, but more Spanish-ish. But now I'm trying to remember, was it André Breton or Louis Aragon that called that triangle in Paris, on the Ile de la Cité, the pussy of Paris, and I am equipped with one of those. But even <laughs> my kitten is multi, multitasked, because I'm not from there either. I wasn't here there non plus. Should I go back to where I was born? There's not one drop of my blood from where I was born. Earth blood, water, stars. Bean seems unknowable. He's a cabinet of treasured souvenirs that include a dried hand, arranged as if there were some way to make these events 
pleasing to the eye. Did you read the title page? Did you read the index? Do you want to walk into history? Walk, stroll, run? We've fallen down, get up. Drink the coffee, or perhaps the chocolate, or perhaps a tisane made from plants and bark, or perhaps this bouillon made from bones, or perhaps just a shot or seven of brandy. Drink down this history gulp by bitter gulp. Slug it back like medicine. If it doesn't kill us, we'll be stronger. I want to know what reason Bean has given me to forgive him. Maybe, though, that's what I like about Bean. He's dead, and he did wrong, and he knew it. The man also knew how to hold a grudge. What, would you rather have a man who pretends to be angelic, who believes he's doing the Lord's work? Now that's a liar. My moose hide moccasins are nearly worn out, and I don't know if I will ever get back to the Yukon to repair them, to have someone wise in the ways of embroidery fix them for me, embroider the stories back into them. In the Mobilian trade language, language Yama, the word for footwear is moccasin. Of course it is. From here on the Gulf in Louisiana, all the way to Montreal, where I'm from, all the way to the Yukon and the great rivers there and the Trondek question. The word is moccasin. I'm going to end the Bienville there. Any of you tiny bit of hopeful sugar? Aww. This one's for Herman. Hopeful sugar like that. As I stand on my front step, two firemen jog past in their red and blue cycling shorts with ludicrous bright flags of thighs and ass. <laughs> yes, like everyone else, I miss the old uniform of micro shorts, which brightened the start of my day. <laughs> Socially distanced, my neighbor Herman stays on his porch and says to me, let's be honest, those men have lovely legs. <laughs> the question is how many notes can you lose in a day and still keep the song? Handfuls? Lungfuls? How much can you give away? How much can you run away from? My other neighbor, who lives in New York in his heart, as Herman says, well, New York dodges away from us. I'll hurry up, morning worry. How nice it would be to walk slow, slow to the corner cafe and sit trying to answer questions when I don't even know the answer. Like what art is about, or how it opens into us, but never transparently. Authenticity, Herman says, isn't just about the good stuff. We hold our own mugs from our own houses and hover on our own stoops. The breeze comes up, silvering ripples, presaging rain. Fragile is my pathetic fallacy. Oh, Heathcliff. Oh, Bridget Jones. <laughs> Herman once admitted to flailing down this very sidewalk, dressing gown flapping to de declare hopeless love to an ugly man. <laughs> Aren't we all like that, though? At least the best of us keep running, keep stumbling wild with glee and with grief. How did I ever envy those glossy sophisticates? <laughs> on a hot Saturday in New Orleans. Next up we have Sarah Courtmeyer, a very good friend of mine. Uh, we met in grad school in Tucson, Arizona. We had our several workshops together, several uh, hangovers together in a workshop as well. 
most every Friday. Um, Sarah Korkmeyer's poems in Gambate diagram a multiculturalism, not the type you'd find in a workplace training video, but the kind earned through an attentive and caring lived experience in different cultures. Not voyeuristic or patently confessional, these poems explore a diversity of the mind, a mind juggling cultural realities to sing a path into a coherent future from our sometimes disastrous pasts. The path cut in these poems is found through language at its physical encounter, where it pours into and out of the speaker's literal body. Sarah fashions these encounters into unifying poems that commit to a serious joy. Sarah won the Felix Pollock Prize in Poetry from the University of Wisconsin Press for her debut collection, Ganbate, which was selected by Carl Phillips and is for sale this evening at the table back there. Her work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Plowshares, Alaska Quarterly Review, The Offending Adam, where she has a chapbook as well of erasures, and The Feminist Wire, among others. She serves as library director of the University of Arizona's Poetry Center, which is one of my favorite places on the planet. If you're ever in Tucson, do show up at that library. It's amazing. Please welcome to the Splice stage, Sarah Kortmeier. This is too tall for me. <laughs> Thank you. I always just freeze um, when the mic is in the right height. I don't know about y'all, it's weird. Um, thank you all so much for having me and for coming out tonight. It is such a privilege and a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure to hear uh, Lisa's work in your words. Um, you lead us by the hand through this history, and it's just um, such an experience to uh, have your voice with us in the room. Thank you so much, that was awesome. myself. Um, I'm going to be spending most of my time this evening uh, reading from this book, which is my debut. Um, I'm very excited to have it out in the world. It did debut about two years ago, right before the pandemic shut everything down. And so this is only the second time I've gotten to read from it in person. So this is extremely special for me. Thank you so much. The book is called Gunbate, um, and it's it's a book that traces my experiences living in Germany and Japan um, after college. Uh, I did that thing where you just kind of dirtbag around and hitchhike, <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. But I also uh, found myself when I was engaged in those travels and living overseas, really thinking about the ethics of how we interact with history as tourists, which is generally what we do, especially if you're touring Europe and have any kind of um, sense of history. You wind up going to battlefields, memorials. Um, I have some Auschwitz poems in here. And like, how, how does one do that <laughs> in a way that is not voyeuristic um, and that helps to advance the arc of justice forward, ever forward? Um, I don't know the answers to those questions, but the book is my attempt to kind of sort them out. Um, so the title of the book is Gunbate. Um, Gunbate is a word that is used a ton in Japanese. It's one of those words you're going to say almost every single day when you're there. Um, and it's, it's a really, it really epitomizes the way that, the, that, that folks' minds work um, in Japan. Uh, it means do your best, persevere, hang in there. Um, and it gets used in all kinds of situations. To just illustrate the breadth of this, I'll, sh I'll give you two examples. Um, one, I took my driving test in Japan. They drive on the other side of the road. Uh, I failed it twice. <laughs> and and the, f the third time I took it, I thought I did everything okay, but I wasn't quite sure. And I'm sitting in the, in the lobby after the test, and the instructor goes, Gambarimashita, like you did your best. And I was like, what does that mean? And it turns out he meant I passed. So that was cool. Um, and then, um, many of you will probably remember the 311 disaster. Um, the tsunami hit Japan, um, and the nuclear reactors got flooded. Um, and there are some really heartbreaking videos of people trying to escape the tsunami online that you see. Um, and you'll hear people in the background crying, Hayek, Hayek, gambare, gambare, gambare. What they're saying is, quick, 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 do your best. And so this word covers everything. <laughs> every little facet of experience. 
Um, and I, 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 want, I want to illustrate that because it's not just me like pulling a pretty word from Japanese, at least that's not my intention. Um, it's a really, really important word. All right, so I'll just kind of progress through this book more or less chronologically. First poem is Horos, Greek. One, a traveled way, a road. Two, a traveler's way, a journey. The idea of a woman as a road has a certain appeal. I think of setting off along myself, boots sucking softly at the mud. The Greeks imagined the uterus hiking up and down, the booted, empty uterus sniffing for blood. And the virgin oracle set a stool above a volcano and squatted down, and Apollo entered her through the vented fumes. The two of them churned that road together until the mud was dust, and her womb cried out with a memory of what had never happened. And then, as she floated, hysterical, inside herself, the god would fill her jaws and speak. I think of a trail crumbling off a cliff in Hawaii, a charred bicycle tire in a Hiroshima museum, a page from a diary displayed behind glass with its own special lamp. Journeys penetrate. Afterwards, songs and the stench of burning from things we thought were private. This is a poem called First Week. It's about my first week in Japan when I knew nobody. There's a lot of white space on these pages. <laughs> first week. My new house had a rice maker, a big bed, a water heater, two tables, and no towels. Ito Sensei brought me two wrapped in cellophane. I have new towels at my house, she explained very slowly when I asked, since you have to have new towels for your guests. One skin per towel. When the guests leave, the towels are thrown out. Ito Sensei brought me to her house. The door was made of some dark, dark wood. Her mother and father bowed to me. It's, it's not the right word. I mean, they crooked their bodies, kneeling their foreheads on the mat. I moved like something very warm very large, a savanna concentrating toward a single drop of rain. I met my desk in the Board of Education. I drafted drawings for the children who were about to visit their sister school in Wisconsin. What's different that they should know about? Ito-sensei asked me. And all I could remember was the way you don't shower all over the floor in American bathrooms. Keep the curtain inside the bathtub, I said, and H stands for hot. <laughs> this is my story, this is my song. Another expat told me about a German sausage restaurant in Miyoshi, and will you hear its name? Saint Schwein. <laughs> he walked three miles through several tunnels under hills and through the sea air to tell me this. I had no <laughs> oven. I adapted all my chicken for the stovetop. My mother's cookies arrived in the mail, and I hoarded them all the way to Thailand. I photographed flowers and walls. I did not take the train to Tokyo for the weekend. I did not join the local choir. There was a welcome party. Ito Sensei brought me a $20 piece of sushi, and I don't remember its name. I went to the 7-Eleven at sunset. Sometimes you could see Mount Fuji from that hill if the wind blew hard at the city air, if the light was gone enough. You could get everything at a 7-Eleven in Japan, including a bill for your electricity. <laughs> I saw you walking yesterday, a student said, and looked at me as though I were a word in French or a leaning mountain far away. So, uh, there's a lot of languages in this book. <laughs> Thank you. I speak them all uh, with varying degrees of mistakenness. Um, so this is a poem about that. It's called Stimmtausch, which in German means, in music, a voice exchange. 
I walk to the grocery store practicing. The language I need is always at the bottom. And I cycle and cycle until finally I arrive at Thaïdes. Along the way, there's just enough time to toss out a pseudo-intellectual meditation on my Eurocentric bias. And while I'm there, I run some verbs and add in objects. Oishi sushi got tap tightness. What I I know I'm really willing today. When I think to like add in desu, I know I'm just really fluent. And in any case, I pretty much always want to eat delicious sushi, right? So this is a good sentence to have at the top of the rummage heap. Holy shit. I'm only walking to the grocery store, but that's for an abenteuer. No, you are not helping. You aren't either. And aren't we dramatic today? But here's the supermarket, okay. Cilantro, or Italian parsley, wrapped in clear plastic, scentless, and I can't read the signs. Okay, so I asked somebody. Cilantro o caitai desca? Cilantro a? I don't know the word for cilantro. Eggs Benedict for dinner then again. <laughs> the first character I learned in Japanese was uh, Kazan, fire mountain, volcano. There are other words with fire inside them when they are written down. Refine, autumn, brave, and Tuesday. <laughs> this poem's called Surveillance. We already know we're watched. When we water the tomato plant, spread ourselves along the couch with one leg up, when we slide the bra strap back underneath the shirt, when we lean to breathe in hair, when we pass a bank and whisper to each other, when we put on our ski masks and burst through the doors, there is something watching us. Please, something, watch us. There's a poem in the middle of this book that is, um, it's dedicated to my father. My father's an actor and a lot of what I have to do as an artist is to differentiate myself from him because if you are uh, intimately connected with somebody working in another medium, there's always an element of um, you have to carve your own path and it can actually be harder when you have artists in the family sometimes, I think. So this is called Inheritance for my father. A man stands at the water's edge in the gray of the afternoon and shouts. His boat has overturned. His hair drips. He shouts for his drowned father. This same man stands in yellow light. It is evening in a church. He is singing, and these are the words. You haven't a nigh, you haven't a leg, haroo, haroo. Johnny, I hardly knew you. An old woman corrects her blouse and whispers, I don't think you should sing war songs here. <laughs> this man is on another stage. He is Titus Andronicus. The lights are blue and his daughter's robes are white. He breaks her neck as she has asked him to do. He shakes and the light shakes with him. called itadakimasu. Um, it's Japanese. It's an expression of gratitude said before eating. It's another phrase that you use every single day. Itadakimasu. The festival floats down the dark stone road. The drummers in night-colored coats, the toddlers in celebration braids, Takashi's daughter brushing aside kimono sleeves to aim her camcorder. The beer began at 8 a.m. and now the rope is dusky in our hands. The shrine bumps immortal and half forgotten behind us. When we stop, the children dance to the flute in masks that make them older. The last of today's meals waits for us at the cemetery, sake, fried chicken, rice, chocolates, fish, but the wives will already be gone, their weekends work cooling under the torches. For us now, as we take our seats next to the still stone crowd, there's only the still closed door between our drunkenness and our dying. This one will go back to Europe a little bit. Fleisch. 
precisish, meaning work done well and quickly. You'll say efficient, and I won't quite let you. Work that is efficient isn't beautiful enough. It lacks a straightness to the hem of the tablecloth, an extra sparkle in the wine glass. House and hill and butcher shop. Cobbles laid down so cleanly, the gaps are still sharp. Add cleanliness to the list then. Work done well, quick, clean. Crumbs brushed away. The bridge in Heidelberg is 1,000 years old. I'm sitting on it. <laughs> Fleisch the dawn. Fleisch the apple. Fleisch the brown tea I have not let blacken. Fleisch the crowded feet on the tram. Fleisch the ehrlich gesagt. Fleisch Ritter chocolate. Fleisch the grass between the bakers and the train station. Fleisch the irre, the madness that overtakes me when I sing hymns. Fleisch the jar to keep honey in, the Kapellmeister with his back to the empty pews, the language in which I learned to jinx before I learned to finish. Fleisch the nearby castle, Fleisch the dent in its wall, the prayer in the breeze, sei geliebt, be beloved. Fleisch the queerness of it, the sitting downness of it. Fleisch the seams in the field, the tray with the candle to keep the tea hot. Fleisch the upper class ticket to Berlin, the valleys in my shoe. Fleisch the wall. Fleisch the air that moves over. Fleisch the boy who shrugged when I asked him the time. Fleisch the crumbs of the wall I've saved in my suitcase. Fleisch the graffiti. <laughs> Help me God to survive this deadly love. Fight your misery, test the best. Fleisch Johanna and the red baubles on her scarf. Fleisch the kid she was growing up on the wrong side, the liquor she buys me as she tells stories. Fleisch die Mauer, she might say. Fleisch the new tampons in the grocery when die Mauer came down, she does say. Fleisch the orange rags she used to strap between her legs, I say. Fleisch the open rain, the pressure of my mother's hands on the sofa, the quiet in the study, the room I crept to not understanding, the soul of the TV news which failed to follow me upstairs, the 10-year-old I was in 1989, the terrible indifference. Fleisch the amends. Fleisch my blinks and my silence. Fleisch the lower windows in Dresden. Fleisch early morning at the Anfang house. Fleisch the wooden chair near her bed. Fleisch the full lobby in the art museum. Fleisch the irgendwo, the wherever to which we travel. Fleisch the music in the Walkman, a nap on the train headed east. Fleisch the Polish town whose name I do not quite pronounce correctly. The quiet gas which none of us smelled. The realm of the suitcase discarded. <clears throat> the sign with a name on it, which we do not understand. We do not know what is a name and what is a story. Fleisch the tenth bale of human hair. Don't worry. There's glass between us and the bale. Sorry, talk about art. Yeah. <laughs> All right. yeah. History does that, yeah. Day trip. It looks like the states, someone murmurs, and we stale, stare at the wideness of the road, the space spent on boulevards. Where Tokyo has multiple stories of everything, lights and stairwells and alleys that twist against themselves like human intestines, Hiroshima is drivable. It has space for the sun to expand. We've been, told, we've been told to try the okonomiyaki here, a word that means anything you like, grilled. The Peace Park is the greenest space in this plant-loving city. They've hung chains of origami on a rod so that the chains and chains of paper of cranes look like jackets and party colors, clothes for a manic phase. Think Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Think of your hometown pride parade. Think of something else. We try to sing for the cranes, Dona Nobis, Dona Nobis, and here we begin to see the false beauty of harmony. Give us, give us, as if singing will bring us pachem. In the museum, a lunchbox, it's open and black. Inside the placard says, it held some rice. I'm pretty sure there was some fish as well. I remember the color, the mass, the blacks. 
I can't see the child without the mess that's left of her meal, the crumbling fuzz of ash, the shadows of stains, and the open locks. Okonomiyaki turns out to be a savory pancake. Mine has egg and squid and a breath of something terribly familiar. I will lighten up here for a second. This is called for emphasis. Oh, you darling time, you can exclaim in German, and anything can be smaller. Oh, my little God. Some vulgarities are much like ours. Kommen means to come in both its senses. Verdammt, verpiss, and ficken mean exactly what you think. <laughs> Some are not like ours. Go fuck your knee, you could say, optimistically. Kids say horny where we say awesome, sometimes with intensifiers. Mega horny like a sow. And anything can mate, where we say henpicked, they say slipper master. Where we say douche, they say you ass violin. <laughs> My German friends didn't want to teach me these. Here at home, it's all they want to know. <laughs> now, this is a Japanese version of this one, Namaru. When I speak, I transform Ningen, a person, to Ninjin, a carrot. We are all carrots here together, I tell the teachers, weeping a little into my school lunch. I thump chopsticks against the tray and earnestly call them stars. To scoop up enchantment with a spoon, to mispronounce. I visited Auschwitz by myself when I was 23. It was intense, I tell people when they ask, can't really be quantified in words. This gets me out of having to explain what I didn't learn. You see a mound of hair, I mean a 10 by 20 foot mountain of fuck me, that's all fucking hair, and there's nothing to be done with it. You curse a lot, you feel this somehow shows respect, you circle it and you reobserve what you learned in kindergarten about Plato. All those colors mixed together look kind of gray. You remember your father making a gray Plato man for his graduate movement class and holding his arms in front of him. You remember how he was his own model. up with the title poem and one more from this book and then I'll uh, move quickly to some newer work. Uh, this is Ganbate, Japanese. Hold out, persevere, do your best. The all pink karaoke sign, the afternoons spent in a square of sun, the lit tatami mat, the asahi gold in the glass, the tatami gold underfoot, the gold light on gold foil. Aftertaste of tang from a green onion, ads in the supermarket, very soft meat, men's pocky, <coughs> azuki beans dripping from a stick, air at the town festival, gold with candles and blue with sundown, the allegiance to blood type, A is sensitive and B is rowdy, American elections on TV and curiosity, why bush again? Couldn't tell them. Bamboo on every hill, bright water in the rice paddy, breakfast sun reflected in the rice water, balls of mochi sticking to the index finger, the British guy in his bloody hells, the broken wine glass. Cold water, when I forget to ask how to turn on the water heater, the cornstarch I make for flour and the disastrous crepes. The cream walls I covered in fabric in red and green and gold, the center of the iris on the table. Dead branches on the beach, dolls in their case for the doll festival and their silks and reds and golds. The dresses I cannot wear to work, the dreams before the earthquake strikes, the dollar I find in a suitcase. The exhaled breath before a punch in karate class. The friend I have not yet written to, leftover sushi for breakfast. The monkey that runs across the road, slinging its baby, the narrow alley with its walls, the house that seemed to perch on top. 
The old man who says, Gambate, every morning as I run along the beach. The question's, how much weight have you gained so far, Sarah son? Hmm. Why are your eyes green? Rowboat on the beach, Mount Fuji swims in the clouds across the bay. The silences between the words I know and the words I need. Typhoon on the roof, the vast crashings of it, the young smell of, young, of leaves in the rain. The edgy feeling in the eyes when we drive all night, the gash of sun above the islands as we arrive, the hair on the statue, the falling down, the inscription, mother and child in the storm. The dome left standing as a memorial, the murdered building, the supports and beams remain, the walls are gone, the thing underneath the blast keeps its structure, like a church, if a church had a skeleton. The story in the English textbook at my school, the teacher asks me to read it aloud. One day, a big bomb fell on the city of Hiroshima. The sign above the blackboard says, move your mouth. I am. I am. She held him in her arms just like a little mother. Palm trees shift in the sunlight outside the classroom window. <clears throat> Morning came and the sun rose, but the girl never moved again. And the children repeated after me. One more from this book. This is called The Dark Constellations. The Inca gave the lightless places names. Fox, toad, serpent, a black llama with faint eyes. The space between my hands and the keyboard. I have forgotten how the sonata begins. Photo printed in black and white so that the wine looks clear. The mirror in a dark room waiting for monsters. In the city sky, the dark animals have never been. The streetlights erase what they illuminate. The pages I ripped from my favorite book when I was two. The sweatbands on the hats my grandmother gives away after the funeral, stained with skin and bandanas. The space between the wedding dress and the small of my back. We remember the dark animals in dreams. They are the wind behind us. They are our history. I don't know where I got this from, we say. Gambate is a really autobiographical book, and since I finished it, I have not been writing in that vein very much. I've been working a lot more with uh, found text, uh, one of which is the chapbook that's up at uh, The Offending Adam now. Um, I'll read a, a few of those, but I want to first turn to, uh, quickly, a project that I worked on with the uh, Märchen of the Brothers Grimm. Um, I worked with the, both the English text and the German wherever I could find it, and I found that the text very, very rewarding, very um, susceptible to remixing. Um, and I've, uh, like, I have a long-standing obsession with fairy tales, so this is part of that book. Get into my phone here. The book is called Hollow Tree. First, the, the, one of the opening poems in the book is called Beginnings, and this is a remix of a bunch of language from the first lines of the fairy tales. In older times, when wishes still helped, youth was the witch. A small man lived like a king and also like a daughter. A queen died, and twelve windows stilled her children. The youngest people worked at naming. A lonely giant wished to see his own forehead. A mother baked one huge day. An evening became sick. The world was a maiden and was poor, and money loved the front of us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's see. Märchen. A beautiful daughter was betrothed at a great distance. She was costly, for the aged queen loved her child with all her heart. She was sent, a vessel of silver and gold, a cup, a jewel, powerless in royal clothes. The aged mother let blood fall. Service, sorrow, 
thirst. If you wish to drink, if you wish to answer, if you wish to help, you can speak. Here is the riddle. You can be stripped entirely naked, sentenced, carried, married, and in such way, you deserve to reign. <laughs> Write a story about one of the following. Vagabonds without hands. Seven apprentices singing themselves to death. <laughs> the mountain. The mountain is really a series of itself. Deeper pockets of sky color float in its canyons. In certain seasons, it's difficult to tell rock face from snowfall. The ridge line looks, looks much sharper than it must in actuality be. When you climb, the summit is sometimes visible. You ran well, says the man who's lived here all his life. From your home, the mountain cannot escape its pairing with the roof of your neighbor's home. From your home, the mountain is visible, and therefore you visit it rarely. There are black bears up there in cooler air, there are campgrounds. There was a fire. The trees are still black. There's a smell of evergreen and a series of pit toilets. There's a viewing point named for seven waterfalls, and one afternoon you counted them all. The mountain bathes itself in light at every sunset, whether or not you are watching. Violent rose and deep blue that flare like love within the span of minutes. But the mountain is not like love. It stands over your home, and sometimes you take a weekend day and climb, but it's not like love at all. Just <laughs> reading off my phone, it's kind of annoying. All right, I will close uh, with just a brief uh, snippet of work from the uh, digital chat book of Sabbath, The Offending Adam. This is called uh, Riot Poetics. It's a series of erasures of Aristotle's poetics. Uh, it's a project that I started doing uh, basically as a game and then found that it had legs, like you do. Um, Aristotle's Poetics, for those uh, not familiar, is a seminal text, and I use that word advisedly, of theater. Um, not necessarily a poetry by the name. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a work that kind of lays out like, what goes into a good tragedy. It is very prescriptive. It is very hierarchical. Um, he's he spends a lot of time sorting people's writing into good and also ran. Um, and it's extremely uh, misogynistic, just in brief flashes. Um, and so I felt pretty comfortable erasing it. I thought I had some stuff to say. Uh, and what I wound up with, I, I went through it and I just erased it page by page, and I wound up with a set of proverbs, really, uh, that I have enjoyed very, very much. So I hope you enjoy them as well. This will be the last bit I'll read. I'll just kind of read these in quick sequence, and I'll, I'll give you a signal when I'm done. <laughs> the inventor is born a verb, a stroll through villages. From childhood, we have produced hymns we cannot identify. We had an inclination toward phallic singing and ceased to evolve. <laughs> People attach their melody to objects. Let's see. Paint a beautiful scale glimpsed on an animal a thousand miles long. Stories should be held in memory, not in water clocks. A story is built around a single wound. A clear chord of poetry, of story, attaches the names to the names. The maker is not the astonishment. The statue is. Death survives us, our imitations, our sufferings, our murders on stage. Finally, I'll close the last one. Poetry is how good questions start. A visible voice, a flu of emotion, a common name for us. Thank you so much. Sarah Corbyn.
Lisa Castle. The Splice Poetry Series. Above all, thank you. The audience wouldn't happen without you. We'd be singing to a blank wall. It'd be crazy. That'd be crazy. But here we are listening. Thank you so much. August 13th, since y'all obviously have a death wish, Adele Elise Williams and Hank Rousseau, as Rodrigo has let us know, is coming into town. It's gonna be really, really good. You should be here. Books for sale. That is so important to a poet. It is like such a thing. It makes their day. It's mind-blowing to think that poetry can equal some sort of money. <laughs> but it can. I'm gonna go drop like $40 right now. I don't know about you, but thank you so much. Be safe, tip your bartender, and we love you. <laughs>